going here. We don't do like that. All right, welcome everybody to uh, the FPGA seminar for uh, January 2016. Okay. So this is uh, will be a talk by Alex about work uh, that he's been doing with Jonathan Rose, and based on a presentation that was done uh, recently at UP. Okay, I'm going to talk a bit about myself first, uh, just to motivate all this work. I'm, uh, I'm an FPGA designer. I really like using FPGAs to build stuff. And uh, as anybody who's built hardware can say, it's kind of our mantra now, that hardware is more difficult to design than software. There's just a lot more moving parts, and you need to do a lot of planning on paper before you even write your first line of Verilog. So to me, anything that can help expedite or simplify that process in any way is just a, a big win. So I'm doing my PhD in just tackling just that, uh, trying to make it easier to design hardware by mostly focusing on uh, the creation of, of interconnect and automated communications. So when I think of hardware, I'm kind of classified into two big things. We have the functional units, which do useful work in computation, like memory controllers and CPUs. And you have the interconnect, which is all the hardware that's responsible for letting these functional units communicate. So in the spirit of making things easier to do, usually one way to do that is through automation. So basically, get somebody else to write some of the Verilog for you. Now, depending on which of these two things you want to automate, I have two different worlds, two different worlds of research and different names for the tools we use to, auto to automatically create the hardware. For automating the creation of behavior, so all these blue things kind of have this world, this field of research called uh, high-level synthesis, where you take languages like C or OpenCL now, and you have a tool that will synthesize that into Verilog for you. Uh, on the interconnect side, which is what I'll be focusing on, the, the, the tool is a little, like a less defined, uh, better name. They're usually called system integration or system-level design tools. And why I choose to focus on Interconnect, uh, it's actually because interconnect can be non-trivial. It's something worth automating. Basically, any time you have more than two things, one thing talking to one other thing, you're going to need something more complicated than a wire in your hardware. So these tools, these system-level design tools, let's talk a bit about those, these things that create interconnect for us. So a system-level design tool, what does it do? You, think, you get it as a user description of the functional modules that you want to have connected, and you give it a set of logical desired links. And what the tool does is it will create a full system for you that instantiates your modules and then connects them with physically auto-generated interconnect fabric. <coughs> and this is all fine and great in theory because now you don't have to write the Verilog for that interconnect anymore. But there's a few catches. catches. Like this, will, this is great as long as two things are true as long as basically the tool does not get in your way as a designer. That can happen in two ways. First, the tool doesn't let you specify, potentially, the kind of communication that you want to specify. And it just has to do with the input side of the tool. Uh, on the output side, what comes out of it, uh, everything's fine as long as the hardware that does get generated is fast and small enough for your application. If any of these two things breaks down, you, you might even not want to use the tool. So I'm just going to go over each of those possible limitations uh, in a bit more detail to motivate the presentation. So going back to the input side of things for the specification of the logical links, whenever you use a tool, it gives you an abstraction to talk about the communication. So those logical purple links that I showed you, what do they mean? Uh, it usually means that the tool kind of imposes a protocol on you, uh, tells you what those links mean. Uh, typically, that can be uh, we can restrict you, let's say, streaming or memory map communications, and that could force you to, for example, uh, make all your communications look like reason writes to memory. So if you can't express your communications like that, you're not going to have a fun time. Uh, another way to classify these communications is the number of destinations that each purple link represents. So when you, whenever you send out a signal, um, how many different destinations do you target at once? Typically, the only model that tools currently support is unicast, where you only uh, speak to one destination at a time. But there are other options, too. There exists multicast and broadcast. And part of my presentation is going to be to motivate why these are actually useful things to have in real applications. 
So as far as the quality of the generated interconnect, what that really translates to for the tool is, despite the tool automatically generating interconnect for you, it's still good to have some control left to the user as to what the interconnect will look like. Um, some ways that I can take shape is with the choice of topology and the pipelining of the interconnect. What topology really boils down to is the shape of the generated network and how your modules are connected. Uh, this lets you basically trade off bandwidth for area. As uh, one of the things about network topology is that it chooses how the logical links are shared over physical medium. And kind of a third meta point that's very important, it's the focus of my work, is the can we make control of these things easy uh, for the user. So in this presentation, I'll be focusing on these three aspects. I will be uh, looking at the lack of multicast and broadcast support and topology customization in existing system integration tools and finding a way to make them, to make them easy to do. So let's look at the existing work in the FPGA space for interconnect synthesis and system design tools. I kind of created three broad, uh, well, two, two broad categories of existing work. First is the set of vendor-provided system integration tools from Altera and Xilinx that come with their design software. Uh, QSIS and I think Vivado IP integrator in the case of Xilinx. So what are the characteristics of these tools? They are full system creation tools designed for the end user and to be easy to use. So not only will they produce interconnect, they will also instantiate and connect the modules uh, that you wanted to connect to your system. It's a subtle but important distinction uh, because you, even if you just generate interconnect, it's uh, more work for you and not as easy if you also then have to instantiate the modules manually yourself and connect it to that interconnect fabric. Uh, these tools, they do not easily let you change the network topology. Basically, they use some the abstraction of a bus or a crossbar and don't fall out for more complicated arrangements. And they do not support multicast. They're generally memory maps uh, or streaming protocols, which can only let you address one destination at a time. So another category is this whole research. So, the, so in academia, we have this whole field of network on chip research. And I don't call these tools, I call these architectures, because there are very few tools. Uh, these are basically are just people who have figured out ways to nicely build uh, network on chip on FPGAs using that FPGA fabric, but there are just very few tools to actually uh, create this hardware for the end user. I, at best, I think Connect and now Hoplite have tools that generate just the interconnect. Uh, one of them is a web-based GUI, which I wouldn't exactly call easy to use. Uh, so there don't exist at this end-to-end -end tool support that you have for the commercial tools. So one feature of network on chips is that they they have often supported, not all of them, of course, but some support, but most of them support so the ability to choose or customize your own topology. And but multicast support is still rare in, in these tools. So I think Hoplite is the only one the part of recent work that's actually had any kind of multicast support. But as far as I know, it's still uh, limited to, uh, it, it still has some limitations in terms of what, how many things you can address in any, any given uh, communication. So you kind of have these two worlds. You have the commercial tools, which have a, a tool, but have been kind of afraid to venture into this network on chip space. And then you have the academic tools, which have developed cool new ways to build hardware, but haven't actually provided the tools to do so. So what I'm doing is creating my own tool called Genie, the Generic Interconnect Engine. And this is our own full system creation tool. It supports full system creation, arbitrary topologies, and multicast. And uh, it tries to do so in an easy way to keep keeping the user experience in mind. And it has more features that are uh, outside the scope of this talk, like automatic clock domain crossing, which are more associated with vendor provided tools. So the grand vision for Genie is going to be this tool that not only lets you create what you want, but will also try to automate some of those choices as well uh, in the form of optimizing those design choices. So our like what I've always wanted, what, what the grand vision is for a tool is I want to be able to give the functional modules I want in my system and this description not just of their connectivity but also of communication patterns and constraints like saying these two guys talk often but these don't. Please make me the best hardware. That's the future direction of Gene. Looking to the past, uh, this is not the first presentation or work, work I've, I've done. If you're coming to these FPGA seminars, I think it's like the third or fourth presentation I've done on this over the years. 
So in the last iteration of this work, we actually used Gini in an FPGA 2015 paper to venture into the sub-IP block fine-grained space where no other tools have really dared to go because they're interconnected just too, too bulky and not worthwhile to exist. And so, you know, future, past, present. What this talk is going to be about and what I talked about in the FPT 2015 paper is just narrowed down to the, the words that are in the title of this talk. I uh, focus on creating multicast capable networks and custom application specific network topologies and doing so in a more traditional coarse grained space as opposed to the uh, fine grained space that I did in the previous paper. A rough outline of the talk is uh, looks like this. So I'm first going to talk about Genie itself as a tool and how it's able to do these these two things easily, multicast and topologies. Uh, we're going to have a second part of the talk, which will give some small uh, design examples. Uh, this is an FPGA crowd. I, I, I have a bit more time than I did in the um, FPT presentation. So I just want to give you a taste of what it's like working with the tool. And then finally, I'm going to actually turn this into more of an application stock where I build one application using Genie to motivate the usefulness of, of a tool being able to do these things uh, and measure uh, the performance and area effects and also compare this application built using Genie with built using a commercial system building tool uses. So let's start with talking about first point, let's talk about, talk about Genie. So the way uh, Genie works is if you ever work with uh, QSIS or any other tools, there should be some of this is familiar and, and very similar at first. So what you do is, as a user, you define one or more components, and co components represent Verilog modules. They, they wrap your, your functional modules. Um, inside each component, you define one or more interfaces. It's so analogous to how when you define Verilog modules, you create input and output ports. Uh, interfaces are just fatter, more abstract input and output ports that serve as endpoints for your logical links for communication. Each of these interfaces physically contains uh, wraps one or more Verilog signals in, uh, in, in the modules. So whenever you, uh, I was talking about input abstractions before, whenever you work with system design tools, they provide some, 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 some signaling protocol you have to adhere to. Uh, Axie is a popular one, you might have heard of that. Uh, Avalon is uh, what's, what Altera uses in its tools. It defines what signals need to be present and what the roles are inside, inside the interface. I'll talk more about these later if anybody has questions, but it's kind of outside the scope. I just, I just want you to know that they, these interfaces are physical things and they contain uh, they, they contain signals that have a prescribed rule, and Dini is no exception. So you have these components that uh, represent your modules. Next, you instantiate them one or more times in a system. Uh, and again, analogous to how you just work with Verilog and modules, you can instantiate them inside a bigger module. And the next step is to create the defined module communication between. So when you do this in Genie, what actually happens, so what, what, what these links mean is they are broadcast by default. So what these logical links that I've shown you in this example, uh, first, I'm going to back up a little bit. So I have, I have three components. I instantiated uh, them once, and B got instantiated twice, to be super clear. And I've made links between them. So what happens now is that when A1 sends data, it's actually going to be sending to B1, B2, and C1 all at the same time. Now. What happens if you don't want to do that? What, what, do you, what do you do when you just want to send it to one or more at the same time? And this is where I'm coming to the difference between Genie and existing tools. This is how Genie is going to be able to, I want to show you is how Genie is able to specify not just unicast and broadcast communication, but multicast as well. It has to do with our addressing scheme. So I'm going to back up, uh, I'm going to rewind a little bit and try this again, this time uh, talking about the scheme that lets uh, you as a user target multiple uh, different destinations. <coughs> So I'm going to your modules again, but before I'm defining logical connectivity, I'm going to define a new thing. It's called link points. So these are virtual named endpoints that exist on top of physical interfaces. And these link points are basically uh, selected by logic living inside a component that drives a signal to select each one. It behaves like, a, uh, it behaves like an address. So uh, but instead of an address in a traditional sense of tools selecting a destination, 
the signal, this link point ID that will be driven, will select a link point. Logical links can now be defined between interfaces and these link points. So let's look at this new picture we've created. Uh, now, whenever A1 selects link point P, it will talk to just B1. When it selects link point Q, it will talk to just B2. And when it selects link point R, then it will broadcast to all three. So these choices of who to talk to are defined by your link points. You select the link point, it selects your destinations. Um, one other cool thing, which I, I haven't shown here for, for brevity but previously, is that link points can exist on syncs as well, so you can actually know who is talking to you, which, which can be useful sometimes if you want to do a request reply kind of thing where you have to know who to send the data back to. So, yeah. Okay, so, 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 so link points are how, are how multicast and broadcast are built the GB, this is the special addressing scheme. This is like one half of this, this section. Um, so far, what I've shown you, uh, everything the user has specified, this now constitutes the full logical specification of the system that goes into the tool. The tool takes over from now, and what it needs to do next is to translate this into a physical system with physical impact. So Genie's physical interconnect is based on one of those previous works that I showed you in a few slides ago. It's uh, from uh, the split merge based uh, inter uh, FPGA knock uh, from the from UPenn, and this, uh, this 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 architecture consists of basically three primitives. You have split nodes that take an input and send it to more than one one or more destinations. The the more than one is my addition, which allows it the multicast to happen. That's that's all done by the split node. You have merge nodes which do arbitration, and then you have buffer nodes. Split and merge nodes are purely combinational. They have no registers. All registering is explicitly done by uh, by buffer nodes, allowing very precise control of how exactly how much registering there is. So this physical interconnect implements the logical links uh, I showed in the, the, the previous slides. But split and merge nodes can be arranged many ways to make different uh, to realize the same logical connectivity. And this is where the next part of the session comes in, talking about topology. So alternatively, instead of building this network, you can actually arrange split and merge and buffer nodes in a ring to create this network, which just as equally implements the same logical connectivity that I showed you before. So how what's what's the user's uh, how does the user control this in G? So what happens is that when you specify the system, you choose what's called, I call it topology function. You have two choices in this. First is you can select the pre-made topology function that comes shipped with Gene. And we currently, current release comes with three. It was a sparse crossbar, a multi-ring, and a multi-bus. I can tell anybody about those for if they, if they want to know. But I will be talking about this one a little bit more. And the thing about these topology functions, and you'll find out why I call them functions, is that they're generic and that you can give them any logical connectivity and they'll be able to operate that to create the split merge and, and, and buffer nodes necessary and, and connect them together with physical internet. Your second option is instead of making a pre-made topology, you design your own. So Genie gives you the ability to create a fully custom topology in which you, the user, writes extra, does extra work to manually create the split merge buffer nodes and connections between them and the physical uh, physical interfaces of your components. So what you want to, well, I'm kind of foreshadowing in the, into the rest of this presentation is that what you want to do this is to create application-specific topologies which take advantage of communication patterns in your specific application. Um, there's, there is more work you have to do in, uh, than selecting a pre-made topology, but one nice thing that Genie still does for you is that it will route those purple logical links over the yellow physical links uh, for you automatically using, right now just using Dexter's algorithm. So the routing is still automatic even if all some of this work is manual. I'm going to talk just, uh, just, just give an example, of course this is the new slide, I, I didn't talk about this previously, but uh, I just want to give an example of one of these topology functions. It's kind of an important one, I'll be using it later in, in this presentation. This is the built-in sparse crossbar topology that comes shipped with Genie. And, uh, I call these topology functions because these pre-built topologies are sets of rules that their algorithms that execute actions. And the topology functions are essentially pieces of uh, rules that converts whose inputs are a logical specification of the system, and whose outputs are the physical uh, connectivity with split, merge, and buffer nodes. 
The Sparse cross chart topology just has three rules. First, anytime you see multiple fanouts, logical fanouts, create a split node. Second, anytime you see multiple fan, create a merge node. And third, which can be tuned, but by default, every merge node is followed by a buffer node. Okay. Uh, one other feature of this topology, and why I focus on it, is because a similar scheme is used in pretty much all the existing vendor tools, including QSys, that will be compared to later. Of course, it doesn't use split merge and buffer nodes. It has its own interconnect primitives. But this uh, this this idea, uh, this, this scheme of, of um, putting distribution and arbitration uh, at the beginning to ends, it's, it's, I think it's called slave side arbitration, if that means anything to anybody. But it's it, it's well known, and it's used by the tools as well that I'll be comparing to. OK, part two of this presentation. I've talked a bit about Genie. I just want to show you the PGA books, I assume, to uh, just a little bit of how to work with my tool. And I'll be reprising the, uh, the inputs and outputs. I've told you the what, uh, some more details about the how and, and how you interact with the tool. So currently, Genie works with script-based input. The, you, you write code to it. It's, uh, it has no GUI yet. Uh, but a lot of other tools, like uh, like QSys, have a tickle-based flow where you create your whole system by writing code. That's what Genie scripting supports, and the scripting language we use is, is called Lua. So all the inputs to the tool, component uh, definitions and instantiations, logical connectivity, topology choice, or custom topology code, are all given in script form. This goes into the uh, Genie, and out comes uh, one system Verilog file per system that you define up here. And each of these systems will contain your instantiated components and a generated interconnect, which consists of instances of split merge and buffer nodes that come as files shipped with Genie. The thing that's missing from this are, is the, the, behavior, the code that defines the behavior of the components themselves. Genie doesn't touch this. This is something that you write and create on your own, and it's, it's unmodified. But you do need all these files down here to actually be able to compile or simulate your system. So I'm going to move on to my first example, and this is the basic Hello World example. Uh, the application I'll be showing later is way too complicated to show uh, in terms of code, I mean, in the time that we have. Uh, so I'll be focusing on the most basic example that I can. And here is the system. A single system called the sys with one instance of each of two components, comp A making a sip insta, comp B making a sip and each of these components has one interface. Uh, one has a, send, a, a source interface called sender. One has a sync interface called receiver. One detail I've left out before is that there's other kinds of interfaces that are needed to make things work. There are clock interfaces, which uh, associate these data transfer interfaces. Called, I call them routed streaming interfaces. That's the name of my protocol. QSIS has Avalon. I, call, I have RS. It's routed streaming. So these RS interfaces need an associated clock interface to tell what clock domain they're on. and um, so there exists clock interfaces as well. And the system, which also, in the way that GD structures things, is also a component, uh, kind of hierarchically. Uh, it has an interface of its own providing the top level clock. Um, you generally, uh, this, this is kind of an artificial example. In the real world, your, your components will want to talk with the outside world as well. So they would have interfaces connecting to top level interfaces for data transfer as well. I've just left that out to make the amount of code I've explained to you less for now. So I'm look at the code, Lua code, that generates the system. I'm going to give it one bit at a time. So here's kind of the preamble of your Lua script. I'm showing you, I'm not leaving anything up, by the way. I just want to show you what completely, just how little code you're going to, to generate some things. Um, just to, uh, importing some packages from Genie to help us build things. Um, create a builder object, which is going to be the way we interact with, with the Genie. First thing we do is we define um, one of the two components. We're calling two components, comp A and comp B. Define comp A with, with the components of uh, functions. I'm going to call these functions because this is basically an API at this point. You're making function calls to Genie to, to define stuff. So comp A is the name of the components. Comp A ver is the name of the Verilog module that needs to be instantiated for this component. So this is something that you wrote on your own. This is something the user created. Uh, next, we define a clock interface that this, that's sat at the bottom of the of, of, of the picture. Uh, so with the clock sync keyword, Again, name of the interface, and name of the physical Verilog signal that it's associated with. 
I don't have to give a width. It assumes clock signals are width one. Some other types of signals you have to give the width for, but not clocks or resets. Uh, next is the other interface we had, which was the one that actually sent data. RS, recall, uh, my protocol is called Rabbit Streaming. RS, that's what the RS comes from. Source means source is going to send data. The name of this interface, as in the picture before, was sender. And uh, the second parameter is the name of the clock interface that it's synchronous to. Within this interface, I define one or more signals that actually uh, carry the data. Now, my protocol is flexible. There are many different signal roles. You don't have to implement all of them. It's not Axie, where you have to you have like 30 different roles and you all have to go. It's a bit closer to Avalon uh, with QSIS, where you can choose the, the amount of complexity in, in your interface. So the level of complexity here is, is pretty, pretty small. It's, it's a data signal augmented with a valid signal that tells it on which cycles the, the, the signal is, is valid. And so that's done with two calls to signal. Each one specifies the role of that signal. So data, these are keywords, data valid, there's ready, and a bunch of other ones. So these, these come from a predefined list. And these are the Verilog signals that correspond to the, the signal. So the, again, this is the binding to, to, to the Verilog land. Third parameter is necessary for data. This is the width of the signal, 10 bits wide. Valid signals are assumed to be one bit wide. That's why there's no third parameter. So this fully defines component A. Next, we'll go through this faster. This is a mirror definition of component B. It's going to be the same as component A, except the name's different, Verilog name's different. This is now a sync instead of a source interface. It has a different name. Uh, these have a pre, uh, I mean, the way I code Verilog, I personally prefix all my Verilogs in I and O, so these, uh, these are going to be different. But the types of signals are, are, are present or the same. Great. Hi. In your logical definition of signals, can you apply more than one data signal? Like yes. Three data signals, RGB. Yes. Yes. Your tool will just make it one plus three. Uh, yes, you can. So, uh, it's, it's like that, that data keyword is not only once per one signal per. I have two different data keywords. I have data of which you can only have one, okay. for safety reasons. If you want, if you want to make multiple one, I have a different keyword called data bundle. You can have multiple data bundles. You have another parameter that gives you a you have to define a unique string tag like RGB or whatever you you want you want to have in your stream that then has to match up with the tags present at the destination or destinations. So component B is defined. Next, to define the system in which these things will be instantiated once. So I've created a system, so it's called the sys, and here's where Topology comes in. This is where you basically give the name of a topology function. This is a built-in one that I imported at the top of the Lua file. With it. There's actually uh, several uh, files that come with Genie where the topology function is for you. These are all written in Lua. You can examine them, modify them if you want. Um, so the, the sparse cross-part topology that I also talked about, that set of rules, is the one I'll be using here. Not that it matters on a single source and single sync. It won't even make split merge nodes at this point. I'll need a more complicated example for that, which I won't do in this talk. So then the system, um, it's funny. The system kind of looks like a component. You can have interfaces, same syntax. I have a clock sync at its edge called top level clock. And this is going to be the name of the signal that, uh, see, this module doesn't exist yet. This is, this, this, this is the name of the Verilog signal that I want it to be called in the module that will be generated. But this, the, the, this system is going to create a module called the sys.sv, created by Genie. doesn't exist yet. This will be the name of the desired name of the clock signal uh, at the top uh, once it gets generated. This is a subtle difference. I'm not referring to something that exists yet. So now I instantiate my components. Instance name, component name, pretty straightforward. Uh, next, I have the links between that top level clock and the clock interfaces. This is where you can start to see the hierarchical naming syntax that I have for referring to interfaces within instances. And finally, I make that one link between the sender interface of instance A and the receiver interface of instance B. And that's it. This, uh, all the code I showed you, generates that example system. Anybody have any questions at this point? Uh, right, that's a good one. Okay. Have more code later. One more example, this is kind of more uh, relevant, so uh, I'm going to talk about custom topologies. And in this example, I'll be creating a very simple, it's a very useless topology function, but it's very educational. 
And what this topology function is going to do is it's going to map all logical links over a single shared bus. So I'm going to show the whole thing at once and kind of go slowly through it instead of repeating it really piecemeal. Uh, some of these blue things are keywords in Lua. And uh, this is where I finally start to show that the kind of the advantages of it being a script within a programming language. You can have things like loops. You can define your own variables. Um, so I'm going to show some of that here. The topology functions are Lua functions. This is how you define a function in Lua. It takes one argument being the system being operated on. The system at this point, at the point this function will be called by Genie, the logical connectivity would already have been defined. So at this point you're now going to be examining the logical links the user has provided and generating physical split merge nodes and, and, and maybe buffer nodes. Uh, so uh, this is just a variable definition. In the Lua, you don't have to declare variables in Lua, so I'm creating a variable uh, called split, which is going to hold reference to my split node that I'm creating with this function call here. I'm asking the system to create a new split node, also unimaginatively just called split. I only have a single split and single merge node in the entire system. So I create those, create those two, I name them, I assign them to variables, and then I ask the system to create a link. This is, this is, this is not a logical link, this is a physical link between the output of the merge node, which gathers all the, all the, all the sources, and the input of the split node. So I'm creating this link here, this little black string here, is this function called here. Uh, next, I'm going to have a for loop, which goes through all of the logical links in the system. So this will, this is generic now. This will work on any logical connectivity that says given to me. Uh, there's a bit of, uh, I don't have to really explain, I told you what it did. I don't have to really get much into details. As the system to give me links, this is the, the types of links to get. I, can, I could have gotten plot signals. Um, ignore this part, and I'm, RS link is the, is, it's going to hold the current link I'm iterating over. I ask to get the source and sync of the link, and I create two links. I create one between this, uh, let go back to the picture. I create, uh, so for this purple link that I'm iterating on, I'm going to connect the source to the merge node and split node to the sync. That is these two lines. That's it. This is this is a very basic topology function. That is not application specific. This can operate on any logical connectivity. Okay, moving on to the third part of my presentation, which is now uh, looking at one particular application that I'll create with Genie and take some measurements and kind of show the usefulness of the two features I've been mainly talking about, which is uh, multicast and broadcast and topology customization and how those can actually. Uh, help you, and how much by how much they can help you by in terms of area performance. So, talk a bit about the application, and the application is. Uh, if you've been to some of my previous talks, you've seen this before, and still, it's, it's, it's the same as different as before. It's uh, my LU matrix decomposition engine, and uh, briefly, what it does is it takes a square matrix A as input, and it outputs uh, two matrices L and U, up, lower and upper triangular respectively, such that. And you multiply those things together, you get a back. So it's what factors A into two matrices. And this is useful in many other linear, as I said, initial step in many other linear algebra applications. So the architecture of the system looks as follows I have parameterizable, tunable number of custom built compute units called CEs, which do the computation. And I have a customizable number of memory controllers, <coughs> off chip memory controllers which hold the matrix being operated on. And they're all controlled by a control node, which uh, assigns work to the control unit, uh, to the uh, compute elements. These are all connected by interconnect, which a tool, Genie, and the one I'm preparing against will generate. Previously, in, in uh, my FPGA 2015 paper, Genie was used to build the interior of one of these nodes. This is where the fine grain interconnect synthesis uh, comes in. Each of these compute elements consists of smaller components. Uh, with a given size idea, each compute element is around 7,000 uh, 7, ALMs, stratix, stratix 4, stratix 5 ALMs. Um, this, these whole systems can be about 100, 200,000, depending on how many CDs and memories you choose. So these are kind of smaller systems uh, in itself, each one of these, and previously used Genie to make the internals of those. In this talk, this paper, 
uh, zoomed out to the coarse grain version of the system and used Genie to build this. So what will what I be talking about? Um, so there's, uh, again, two parts. The, the, uh, how, how multicast is applicable to this, to this design and how it's useful and how changing the topology can be used to uh, exploit application-specific, highly application-specific behavior that exists inside the system. First, I have to talk a bit about more how the compute and memory are organized. So I have this matrix, stored in object memory, and I've, it's actually uh, broken up into 64 by 64 blocks, blocks of size 64 by 64, and columns of these blocks are assigned to alternating memory controllers. Uh, if, I, if I have two memory controllers in this example, this is how they would be assigned on a matrix of size 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 8 by 8 blocks. On the compute side, I have the compute elements which operate on the matrix. And how it works is each compute element gets assigned one column to work on. It works in a single threaded manner, starting at the top and working its way down <coughs> processing block by block. At every single block that is processing, it requires inputs from not just that block, but also from two others. Uh, one at the very top of the column that it's in, and one at the very left of the row that it's in. Because I have multiple compute elements working in semi-lockstep, what's going to happen is they're going to be go each independently going down their assigned columns, and they're all going to be requesting that same left block. Now, uh, the memory controllers could just return four copies of this block, but the, here's the opportunity we have to use broadcast to actually return one copy to all of them and save that one. So now I'm going to just do an experiment in which I uh, measure how, if, uh, actually how much performance benefit this has. So this is done in simulation on a big enough matrix so that I can utilize 64 compute elements and use lots of compute elements to have lots of traffic going on just to saturate the bandwidth and I'm going to try using one, two, and four memory controllers. So what it did was ran uh, the LU or algorithm on this matrix and measured the runtime in milliseconds. It's varying the number of memory controllers and then changing whether or not we use this broadcast optimization for the left block or whether we redundantly return multiple copies of that left block. And here are the percentage savings. You actually save about 26 to 34 uh, percent execution time by using the left block broadcast. That's how effective it is. Looked in another way, by using left block broadcast, it's as good, if not better, than adding a whole other physical off chip memory controller in, in this case. So, this is a very useful uh, broadcast can be taken advantage of for great bandwidth settings. This is the point I'm trying to make here, and, and in, in, in the cellular application. Take advantage of this optimization in Genie, all you have to do is use link points, and uh, that scheme I talked about before will automatically handle the distribution of uh, return data to multiple destinations. So this is, if you, want to, if you want to take advantage of this, Genie makes it easy to do. Okay, switching gears, talked about multicast and how it was useful and by how much it was useful. Now, to talk about topology customization for the cellular application. To do that, to talk a bit more about the logical communications that actually happen within this application. Most of the interesting traffic is going to be the compute elements reading and writing matrix blocks from memory. There's three kinds of transactions going on here. There's read requests to the memory controllers, there's read responses from the memory controllers, and there's write requests when each block is being written back to memory. And there's also two kinds of reads, as I said before. There's, there's, uni, there's unicast reads for the current and top blocks. And then there is the broadcast read replies, the broadcast mechanism for the left blocks, which looks like this. Uh, the requests for the left block are aggregated at the control node, forwarded once to a memory controller, and then broadcast to all the compute elements simultaneously. So the broadcast mechanism I showed before in the previous slides, this is how it works. And, uh, this memory controller would have a broadcast link point that allows it to send to everybody, in addition to unicast link points that allow it to send individual requests as in the previous picture. So this is the logical connectivity. What's the best? Uh, what we want to do is try to create a customized 
topology that will take advantage of this communication to create either a better performing or a smaller area physical interconnect. In the interest of time, we'll be looking at just the network for the read responses. Each of these different kinds of communications will actually be on separate networks with their own, potentially their own topology. Uh, we'll be looking at just the read responses because uh, this application is the most interesting to look at and have the greatest difference between a stock uh, built-in topology choice and a custom one that I can come up with. So I'm going to implement this uh, read uh, response networking using two topologies. One is the sparse cross part topology that comes packaged with Genie that I've shown many slides back. And one will be a custom one. So the first topology, the sparse crossbar, if I apply those rules that I talked about, uh, the sparse cross part topology to that logical connectivity, to an example system version of LU, on uh, which I have two memory controllers and eight compute elements, this is what the physical network will look like. A split node at the output of each memory and a merge node at end buffer at the inputs. Uh, the buffers of the, this, I optionally buffered the split nodes too. Uh, but there will be a merge node at the input of every compute element. Uh, both the unicast and broadcast read replies can go over this. Uh, for example, memory zero can broadcast to, to all of them when the split node decides to send it to all the compute elements. This choice represents the easiest to use choice because all you have to do when writing your Lua code for the system is say the topo x bar in your system definition. That's it. That, 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 that creates it. So, can we do better for this application? To be able to do better, we can start analyzing the communication patterns and, uh, that actually exist in, in this read response network. First, I have to look at, go back to how memory is organized. So recall that with two memory controllers, the matrix will be broken up into alternating stripes assigned to alternating memory controllers. What also happens is that the compute elements will be assigned columns in a modular fashion as well. Uh, this matrix could potentially be bigger in both directions, and then this pattern will be 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 2, 5, 6, 7, 0, 1, 2, 5, 6, 7. This particular arrangement leads to an observation that the compute elements will be broken up into uh, their association with one of the two memory controllers. See that memory controller 0 is going to service compute elements 0, 2, 4, 6, and memory controller 1 is mostly going to service compute elements 1, 3, 5, 7. Say mostly because recall that the compute elements are also assigned in a column-wise fashion. They work down the column. They're going to act the accessing blocks in their assigned column and at the top, mostly. And also, the only time they ever have to access outside their column is when they have to access the left block. So most of the communications is within their assigned column. Most of the communications is with their uh, memory controller responsible for that column. So this uneven distribution of bandwidth. Uh, here's a more mathematical way of putting this relationship. Uh, you know, when I communicates with memory, I want to have two memory controllers here. So in designing a custom topology, we should exploit this application-specific communication behavior. And this is what the second custom topology does. Let's look at it for a while. Make one observation before I talk more about it. Is that it has fewer merge nodes. Split and merge nodes are, are less, fewer, but uh, merge nodes are the ones that actually take up most of the internet. So that's why I focus on that here. So this, uh, there's a few animations to convince you that this topology still implements all the communications that are possible. So the in-column reads, the ones where the compute element accesses stuff in its own column, they look like this, and they can operate in parallel without any competition. When broadcasts happen for one memory controller to everybody, this is the only time that things have to cross to the other side, and that's what this looks like. I'll play it again because it took me a few times to look at this. memory zero for first gets all these uh, then it goes to this then it goes to the bridge node yeah, but then, but then it goes then it also goes to the other side's bridge node and it's splitting out and reaches the others so that's how broadcast is done with this topology everything still works when doing a broadcast I'm not competing with anybody else because the only thing should be happening is a broadcast and uh, yeah write extra code to do this We'll measure how much later. But uh, all of this, all that complicated uh, red path stuff is done for you by Genie. 
uh, from the same logical mutation specification as, as before. Okay, uh, recall there are three networks. I show you two vertical options for the big response network. There also exist two options for the other two networks, which I won't go into. The details are in the paper. And the effect of these custom topologies was either to reduce area, as the one I showed you, or to actually add extra merge nodes and buffer nodes, increasing area, but also increasing pipelining and call frequency. That's just what some of the others have done. Um, to get the measure of the effect of this, uh, custom versus, so this is genie versus genie, uh, custom versus sparse cross bar. So those two topologies I showed you. Uh, all three networks with, custom, with their custom versions, or all three networks with their generic sparse cross bar versions. Uh, tested this on large systems with uh, 32 compute elements, and measured the full system size, not just the interconnect, the full system size in uh, number of thousands of Stratix 5 elements. The table. So very number of memory controllers, keep compute elements of 32. I have a crossbar topology, custom topology, measure the area of thousands of AMMs. And I'm going to call it result the wash. There's a bit of uh, area increase because some of the topologies do increase area to, 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 to increase performance. Um, but if the largest systems, it's actually a tiny bit smaller when you use the custom topology. The real wins actually come in, uh, in, in clock frequency. I'll check the time. Um, so, in the interest of disclaimer, there's two clock domains in this design. Uh, we'll be measured the one that does uh, the communication, the communication related clock domain. So, it's same, same thing, 32 compute elements, vary the number of memory controllers from 1 to 4, and measure the network clock frequency. See, this is where the real benefits come in. Get about 50% improvement in clock frequency by using the custom topology. So, topology customization. This application is a very good thing to do to put effort to, into into writing a custom topology function, while still not having to do it in parallel, having a lot of automation done for you. It's a it, it's it, it's a pretty good way to design things, I think. We move on to the final. Uh, oh, these are just uh, just explanations of words for what I said. So, 50% speed up. Why more buffer nodes and uh, therefore more pipelining in some of the topologies I didn't show you for the other networks I didn't show you. And also, there are smaller rate merge nodes, uh, smaller boxes that also contribute a bit to it. Okay, final comparison. Everything before here was Genie versus Genie. Now it's Genie versus another tool, QSIS. So this, uh, QSIS does not support some of these features. You can't customize the topology, you can't do multicast. So the QSIS version of the system will have the left block broadcast non-existent. It will do the redundant uh, requesting of left, of left blocks. And it will have a topology that you can't choose, which looks a lot like my sparse crossbar. This makes a good comparison point. But why I've talked about it so much for Genie. So you can have an apples-to-apples uh, apples apples comparison at some point. So what I'll be measuring is QSIS versus Genie, the best version of the Genie system, which has multi which has multicast and it has uh, left block broadcast and it has the custom topologies that have those awesome frequency improvements. I'll be measuring area clock frequency and importantly wall execution wall clock time, which is Arguably more important than clock frequency alone, so runtime every application. Um, one other thing I'm measuring a little bit, or I try to measure is ease of use. I talk about ease of use a lot. Can't, hard to quantify. Best way I can do is by measuring lines of code. Both these systems are created in scripts, Lua for Genie and Tickle for QSIS. Try to use as few lines of code as possible by using loops and not having huge verbose copy and pasting in both cases. And uh, when I use a custom topology, one I'll be comparing with, with Genie, it's actually it's a, a bit more lines of little code than, than the typical code for, for QSIS, but I am actually controlling more. I'm, control, I'm creating a whole custom topology. <coughs> to take that out and use the default source cross code, so basically using the default for both, uh, the, the little code to describe the system, uh, with a, a default topology requires fewer lines of code than QSIS does using its only slash default topology. That's, that's how I quantify the ease of use at this point. Best I can do. Okay, on to the other comparisons. Let's we'll start with area. Explain this big graph I have. So, what, what, what am I doing? I'm, uh, I, I'm building this, this system twice once with Genie, once with QSIS. Each uh, system is going to be configured with two dimensions, uh, possible dimensions. I'm going to change the number of compute elements to 1 to 32, and change the number of memory controllers from 1 to 4. 
and then I had so uh, and then I have all the Qsys versions in blue and Genie versions in orange. See that area increases quite a bit as you increase the number of compute elements, and also when you change the number of memory, more memory controllers, you're going to have more connectivity. It's going to increase the area more so for Qsys than for Genie. Explain a few gaps in this as well. So it's the same picture. I've just moved it up to make room for text. Um, and examine the rightmost side of this graph with the biggest systems. One thing it's, you notice is that there is something missing for, for the QSIS version, and that actually the, the, the QSIS version system would not fit. To be more precise, it fit, but it did not route. I, I, I have a number to go here. I got recently, it didn't make it in the time. It's about 280,000. So I managed to extract a partial fitter report <coughs> from, from, from Portis. Uh, that's, 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 that's the size. So what do we see here? Again, uh, looking at the biggest system, different number of memory controllers corresponding to the three columns in each. So there's six entries here, six entries, well, five entries here, because what's missing. And um, it's about GD wins here uh, as you increase the number of memory controllers. So again, this is around 280,000, this is a bigger number. It scales better with increasing complexity is what I wanted to say. If we look at just the interconnect, this is a full system size. Just around, you know, huge number of huge number of ALMs. Uh, if you look at just the interconnect, the savings are actually, well, the loss and then savings uh, later on by Gene are actually significantly more. So my conclusion is that the custom topology is allowing Gene to perform really well in terms of area as you increase from system complexity. Uh, moving on to network clock frequency, so measuring FMAPs here. Goes down as things get bigger, more more good elements, more memory controllers. The colors are the same. Moving the graph up, looking at the biggest systems again, and this is where it get awesome improvements. So G is wiping the floor with Qsys because of the, uh, the because of the custom topology uh, that we saw the huge gains from before is one contributing factor. This is just the network clock again. There's uh, tangential effects on the contents of the function modules too for the compute clock. Uh, just want to show that that method that there. And finally, the most important measure of performance, wall of execution time. Frequency can be whatever, but I care about how fast my application runs. A different kind of graph here. Vary the number of compute elements from 1 to 32. Uh, and I measure a relative speed up of the Gini version versus of, of, of every data point versus the base case of QSIS with one memory controller and one compute element. So this is the base case. Speed up goes all the way to 15 for the fastest 80 versions. Focusing again, as I've always done, on the right has the most hand side of the biggest systems that I can build. Uh, looking at the absolute times now instead of the speed up, we get 35% improvement in performance by using Genie, custom topology, and using that left block uh, broadcast mechanism, which is also providing a lot of the performance gains. So in conclusion, we've created and continuing to work on Genie, which is our full system creation tool. Uh, in this talk, we show that it can be used to easily specify multiple cast capable interconnects and a custom, create custom topology that exploits application-specific behavior. And uh, we used Genie to create a application of this LU factorization engine. And we compared the implementation of that with QSIS and showed that area scales better with complexity, and that you have better FMAX and application runtime. <coughs> the next steps I'm working on is I'm going to have a set of, I'm kind of tired of this LU thing. I've been using this, for example, for years. I have a new application. I'm working on a convolutional neural network where broadcast is going to become a very important thing to take advantage of, and Genie will be really um, add new features to Genie as I go along. And uh, most importantly, continue that grand vision of optimization, where these, so in, I've showed you all these application-specific optimizations. I had to do that as a human. I had to figure out what the, what the patterns were and then design the topology to fit. I'd like to live in a world where I can specify some of those things at an even higher level of the tool, and it will design custom topologies, for example, for me to exploit this behavior. So the software, it's open source, comes with documentation and examples. Get it here. And uh, that's it. Thanks. Can you go back a couple slides to that final data slide? <coughs> yes. Yeah, so what was the difference in performance between the 16 unit CE between uh, Q6 and U? 
Dependency performance between because on thirty two you couldn't have four memory controllers, right? So is that was your comparison between the two memory uh, controllers at thirty two and thirty two? Right. Oh, I missed an important thing. You're right. Uh, I missed the fact that this walk up execution time was done in simulation. So I didn't have to have to. Oh, I have okay. To that sense. So I used quarters to fit to measure F max and to measure area, but execution time was done in simulation. So I'm being even. I'm being a bit generous here by saying head pieces been able to generate these systems. Oh wait, no, yeah. So no, it's between. Okay, wait, great. Right, talk. So no, I, I'm looking at only the, the things that have been created. You're, you're asking about 16 now. I, I don't have uh, numbers on this slide for 16. I have numbers for 32, and yes, the four memory controllers was excluded for for uh, 32. So this is the comparison of 32 with two memory controllers. Between yes, one between two or one memory controllers. For for 16 computer elements, I could I had four memory controllers that could fit. I just don't have percentage comparisons here. Sorry for confusion. Jason? Very nice comprehensive work. I have uh, two questions for you. Thanks. Uh, the first one is the level of abstraction for multitasking. Uh, does the user still have to create their own control uh, module to control when the multitask happens to synchronize uh, the signals? Are you talking for LU specific or general? Uh, LU specific, then general. Well, it depends what part you're talking about. So the multicast happens. Um, the communication path from the memory controller to the compute elements as it's returning read data. That path, all the memory controller has to do is specify uh, a link point that connects to all, leads back simultaneously to all, to all. So as far as the amount of work you have to do, uh, all, all memory controller just has to output the right signal to say, I am now broadcasting, and then the game will, will broadcast. Mm -hmm. Uh, as for how the whole entire end-to-end -end request to reply broadcast uh, aggregation mechanism works in LU, is that uh, the compute elements in the beginning, the compute elements know they're reading a left block. They will not send a request to the memory controller. They will send it to the control node, the central control node, which knows how many compute elements are currently spawned. They will receive that many, or wait till it receives that many left block requests from all of them. For one copy of that request, to the appropriate memory controller for, for the right column that holds the left block. Then, and then that memory controller will know to, uh, I mean, it, in that request, it will know it's a left block request, so it will know to reply in a broadcast fashion. So in LU, that's how that whole chain works. There's still user work required. But as far as the final leg where the broadcast, where the data is actually copied multiple places, that is handled by Genie, and all you have to do from your modules point of view is drive the link point ID you defined that says, I am a broadcast link point, I am connected to everybody. Uh, so if I was, say, using QSYS instead of Genie, what I'll have to do is, I'll still, and I wanted to do, say, multicast, mm -hmm. I still have the control node, but then I'll have to, have to handle the actual broadcast myself. The, the syncing thing would be the same between the two. Yes, so with, with QSYS, you'd actually have to, so if you want to continue using Avalon MM and not have any, uh, any actually, no. Kisses, with Kisses, if you're to use memory map interconnect, you have a master and a slave. It is implicit in the contract that when you request to the slave, it will return data back to the master. Here we have three players. We have we have control, we have control of uh, compute elements. It doesn't go to the memory controllers. It goes to a third party like this. You can't do that with a memory map abstraction at all. You have to build everything out of streaming interconnect, build all the distribution and arbitration yourself manually and uh, it would not be a fun time at all. So if you want to build exactly the same kind of hardware with pieces, if you could not use Avalon MM, you'd have to use streaming, much lower level than what Dini provides. Or you, you would point up a point-to-point -point links that exist between one source and one destination. You manually instantiate all the hardware that distributes and arbitrates yourself out of Avalon ST components. Does that make sense? Well, alternatively, I use the export just for the multicast part, and I use Avalon multi uh, memory map for the rest. Export again conduits. Conduits, yes. Conduits. Uh, oh. it's basically you custom view. That custom. Yeah, I guess you could, but then you can't add pipeline into it. You have to. You you export. Oh, export. Build your own hardware and then come back. Yeah. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah. Sure. But I agree. This is a much more convenient. Okay. okay that's that part of it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's that, that's right. That's why you would do it with users. Uh, the second question, I guess, is the has to do with latency. Yes. So, uh, if for your system, do you have implied latency uh, in your interconnect? So, so the, the, the topology controls that. So the recall, flip and merge nodes are combinational. They have no zero latency. All latency is added through buffer nodes, which currently, it could be a FIFO right now, it's a skid buffer through registers if there's back pressure. 
So uh, the topology controls that, essentially. So because like we've had three consumers and three producers sharing one link. Yes. How do you handle, uh, say, asynchronous consumers, where some consumers might be faster than others, and you do the multicast? How do you handle the buffering uh, or the delivery of the, it's, it's packet-based, so let's say connection oriented. Uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do you, you know? My protocol, uh, so it's a good question about the protocol for to answer that. So the protocol is packet-based, where the packets are one cycle, oh, by default, one cycle long. So it's word, every word is switched independently. Right. If you um, if you want trains of like a, a burst, I have an end of packet signal, much like Avalon does, where when you if you don't assert it, uh, the the switching kind of stays fixed until it's done. Okay. Merge nodes will not will not switch their router over arbitration until a packet has gone by. But by default, packets are single cycle wide, so it looks like there are no packets. If you use this end of packet signal in your communications in your in, in your interfaces. But now, you, now you have bigger packets, and the, it looks it looks circuit switch. Right, but I guess when you do the OK, the multicast, the yeah. packet comes, and then it gets find out. Yes. And oh, and you're saying what if some of them? them. What, what if some of them are not ready to consume? Yeah, that's what you're saying. Okay, so it's, so called the split node is the primitive which handles taking in one thing and potentially sending it to multiple points. It can handle back pressure. How it works is like this: uh, um, the split node has several things it wants to send to. If not all of them are ready, it will wait until they're all ready. And the scheme in which I do that is very careful to avoid certain kinds of deadlock, but it will essentially wait until they're all, all, all selected, currently selected destinations are ready to receive that they, they've asserted their, valid, their ready signal. Yeah, that was the next question. Yeah. Well, application level deadlocks, I can't, can't do yet. Maybe in the future when you can describe things at a high enough level that Gene knows what your patterns are. Um, routing deadlocks? Up to you to resolve right now. So if you create topologies that have cycles, um, that's right now it's your problem. The other thing I want to comment, want to comment uh, in terms of difference between what Silex and Altera provide. Yes, uh, I find it very leading that their world ends at one of the year. Right? So, so uh, I can see how your Lua-based uh, abstraction can very easily extrapolated to multiple FPGAs, perhaps, and that uh, that's something you cannot do. You have to do it manually yourself, explain it yourself, and handle all off-chip off or inter-chip communication. Well, the, the problem with uh, multi-FPGA communication is the fact that it now necessarily uh, involves uh, FPGA hardware-specific um, communication in instantiating the right kind of off-chip interfaces to communicate. Someone's going to have to do that for you, and you can't do it in a generic way. If you're using a, a if you're using the Stratix, whatever, GX, the PGA, um, might, you're, you're need a tool that knows about its transceivers, how to instantiate them, and, and do that. Using, you have a totally, totally, you have a different chip, it's going to have to create LBDS lanes. Like, it's very FPGA specific to do after communication. So, to handle that, it's basically, you need work to support a library of primitives that are architecture specific, IO, IO specific stuff. Yeah, for example, I can see Ethernet. Pretty standard, potentially, and it has a really support for multicast. It's a much higher level than I think you're designing at, but yeah, oh, right. One of the benefits of having an abstraction that uh, works with code, you can create libraries of functions that automate stuff like that for you. Yes,